Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the uh, last uh, session of Track 4, Science and Technology. Uh, my name is Pam Mason. I'll be your um, host for this session. Our last breakout session is going to dive into the world of gene therapy and what the future holds for the promising area of science. It will be presented by Maury Rufin, the Managing Director of the Alliance of Regenerative uh, Medicine, Tim Miller, the CEO of um, Abiona Therapeutics, and Walter Straps, the Senior Director of Biology at Intellia Therapeutics. So please join me in welcoming, welcoming them. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So I know we've got about 45 minutes. I just said a little bit about what we're going to do over the next 45 minutes. Um, uh, I'm going to invoke the moderator's prerogative and, and give you a few overview slides to kind of set the stage for the discussion. But what we're really going to be doing in this, in this session is delving into what gene therapy and genome editing, specifically CRISPR, is, how it works, um, what the technology is. Uh, we're going to try and demystify it a little bit for some of you. Um, and then really explain why we believe this is profoundly important for why we're here today. And, uh, and that is to talk about how these technologies can help us treat rare genetic disease. So very exciting stuff, and, and we'll get to it in a second. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine. So we're, we're here uh, at the invitation of, of Nicole and, and, the, and the team at Global Genes because we have um, we've been working with them really over the last two or three years to, uh, to put together a partnership around joint objectives uh, focused on rare disease and, and some of the technologies you're going to hear about today. This is, uh, I think, as you'll hear from us, not anything that we can do alone. If this really involves partnerships. That's what the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine is all about. So let me just, I want to just go through a couple of slides with some background on who we are. So, ARM is an organization that was started in 2009 uh, with 17 charter members, and the reason for this was at that time there was a recognition that, that cell therapy and then gene therapy, um, which, which has really come into the headlines, as you know, in the last three or four years, uh, was a dis were disciplines that really needed a, a separate effort. Um, I think up until that point in time, a lot of it was kind of rolled into the, the broader term biotechnology. But, but these are, are really disciplines that, um, and as you'll see in a minute, because of what we're trying to do, that require a special focus. And, uh, and it was with that in mind that we put this organization together in 2009. As I said, started with 17 members and now have over 250. And, and it's a global organization. We work with companies and organizations all over the world. Uh, but we are really the voice for this sector in Washington, and we work in partnership with a number of different stakeholder groups. And some of them are mentioned here. Um, so it's not a trade organization. I want to be very clear about that. Uh, although we do have a number of companies, and industry plays a very prominent role in the organization. But we also work with patient groups. They were uh, the JDRF and a couple of other very uh, notable patient groups were part of our initial charter team in putting the organization together, but many others have come to work with us since then. But we work with hospitals, research foundations, tools and service companies, engineering firms, every, all parts of this uh, that I, I think are going to be important in ultimately delivering these therapies to patients. And as I said, it's global, so it's not just in the U.S., uh, it's really around the world. I mean, many of the companies even in the U.S. are sourcing technologies in Europe and Asia, and, uh, and there's incredible work happening in all of these locations. So clinical trials being conducted all over the world. So this is really a global endeavor. And, and it's, you know, this slide is really meant just to show the breadth of the work that we're doing. And certainly you've heard about the work going on in a number of these diseases uh, today and over the course of the day tomorrow. And this is just uh, some of them. I mean, obviously there, there are many, many more. Um, but all of these, I think, share one thing in common, and that is our belief that, that we can make a real difference with these technologies you're going to hear about, that, that we can really uh, move the needle on this, in some cases uh, cure the disease, but certainly have a profound therapeutic impact. And in terms of companies, uh, many of these companies didn't exist even three or four years ago. I mean, that's how quickly this field is moving. Certainly these, uh, the genome editing companies here, I think most of them are 
less than two years old. Uh, that is true for a lot of the gene therapy companies as well, uh, even though we mentioned some of the large pharma companies, they're working in the space. But this is uh, a space that is growing rapidly. Uh, I think there's a real recognition now, today, uh, really across the board, that these technologies work. Uh, it's a question of what we need to do next as we continue to build towards bringing these products to patients. And so with that, I'm going to hand the podium over to, and actually I think he's got the wandering mic. I'm going to hand it over to Tim, who's going to talk about gene therapy. Thanks, Maury. So we're going to kind of do some of this as a little bit of fireside chat type. So we're going to talk about a couple different slides to make sure that everybody's level set on you know, some of the basics on gene therapy. And then we're going to talk about how we're going to develop superpowers, because who doesn't want superpowers, right? So first, as we all know, you can get bitten by genetically by, by a spider. You can be immersed in toxic sludge. Although this is one that's careful. You have to be very careful about. You can be exposed to cosmic radiation, but that often involves space flight, which has not been as successful as some of the gene therapy trials that we've seen recently. And you can imbibe a chemical super formula, which is, of course, one of my favorites. Or you can inherit an X gene or another one of the genes that has often a rare disease mutation. So gene, gene therapy, as we kind of try to talk about what is gene therapy, there are two main ways that you go about it. Um, you can either replace a, function, a, a gene and its function, or you can try and go in and correct it by editing it at its source. And so gene replacement or editing technologies provide a long-term potential uh, for rare diseases that have no or few other treatments available. And again, as you can see here, these mice have, uh, have hulked out a bit and uh, are certainly turned green, or they're really expressing what's called a green fluorescence protein, or they've been genetically modified to glow green. So, and really what we're trying to do is find ways that we can find better, more therapies for kids with rare genetic disorders. And so to start really at the basics, um, at DNA, RNA, and protein. So DNA is this molecule, if I can find the pointer, right here. It is your DNA footprint, your fingerprint. Um, DNA makes RNA, whoops. DNA makes RNA. Okay, and then RNA makes proteins, proteins such as enzymes, things that break down these sugars or have a specific function in DNA replication. Um, these are the things that are really the workhorses of your body, but it really starts with DNA. And so when we talk about things like autosomal recessive uh, mutations or things that are X-linked mutations, this is what we're talking about, changes in the DNA structure. And so alternative names for genetic engineering, gen gene manipulation, modification, recombinant DNA technology, gene splicing, gene cloning, gene editing, gene replacement. So there are two main types of gene therapy. Um, one is a direct delivery, where you can take a therapeutic gene or something that has gone wrong, you're trying to replace a functioning copy. Um, this can then be directly injected, whether you're doing an intramuscular injection, something that goes directly into um, to the skull, into the, into the spine. You can go into the intravenous system by giving an IV injection. Um, these are all direct methods for trying to get DNA back into the body. Um, and then there's also there's cell-based delivery, where you can take cells out of the body, so adult stem cells. You can correct them in a Petri dish using a variety of different um, gene editing or, again, gene replacement strategies. And then you grow these cells up and you split them um, and then you put them back into a human. So when we talk about you know, two main therapies, there's direct or there's cell-based. And you can do this a variety of different ways. Many of the ways that we go about it, um, through Intellia, through us, Voyager, Abiona, um, using genetically modified viruses. So there are many different types of viruses. Uh, you know, the ones that you hear most commonly referred to are adeno-associated viruses or lentiviruses. Uh, we won't go into it. This is what they look like when you take um, a micron, um, uh, electron microscope and take a picture of the actual virus. This is what they look like. It's a very um, elaborate structure. These proteins on the outside are involved in what's binding the cells and the, the DNA that you're trying to correct is on the inside. And then so we talk about gene replacement strategies. So a gene replacement is going in, is trying to go in and, and replace the, the, to put in a correct functioning copy of the gene. Um, these are non-permanent corrections. Now, when you get these type of viruses to, to inject the DNA into the cell, depending on the target tissue, it can last for years, potentially decades. Um, frankly, the field doesn't know yet. 
current examples out there and large animal models have shown that it, it can last for over a decade. Um, but again, those are still you know, in process. We're still trying to find that out. And you can do this by either a viral way, such as an adeno-associated virus or AAV, or you could do this through the non-viral methods using something called plasmid DNA. And then you can also go to the other side, something that's more permanent. So that's where these, um, the DNA editing technologies come in or technologies where you do actual integration. And so this is using a virus called a lentivirus, or as Walter's gonna talk about some of the CRISPRs and Talons, um, other ways to actually go in and use as, as a pair of molecular scissors, cut out the piece of bad DNA and put back in the correct functioning, the correct version. And so just as one or two quick ways of um, talking about adeno-associated viruses. So one of the things that you hear about so much in the media today is AAV. So these are adeno-associated viruses. These are packaging, gene therapy. And if there's one thing that you take out of this lesson or out of this, out of this tonight, is that gene therapy is all about delivery, 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 delivery. Oftentimes we know what the problem is. We can find out, you know, and many patients come and ask and they say, you know, my son or my daughter has this particular rare disease. It's an autosomal recessive disease. Can a cure or can a, a therapy be made for it? And the answer a lot of times is, well, the state of the field of gene therapy has gotten to the point where the delivery vehicles have gotten better. Um, they're not perfect yet, but they have gotten better. And so when we talk about AAV vectors, we talk about these different serotypes. So AAV2, AAV8, AAV5, AAV9, you know, these are all different types of AAVs, and some of them are better at different tissues than others. So AAV9, for example, is good at crossing the blood-brain barrier. It's the only one that crosses the blood-brain barrier and able to get into the brain. AAV5, AAV8, these are great for liver transduction. AAV1, maybe for skeletal muscle. So when you think about a particular disease and you talk about looking at a gene therapy for either replacement or for editing, often this is something that you, un you want to try and understand is that these tropisms talk about how the, the gene therapies um, are able to find and target specific tissues. And so with that, I will turn it over to Walter to talk about an overview on gene, oops, gene editing strategies. Um, thanks, Tim. So all of these strategies that I'm going to discuss now, these gene editing strategies, they all have the same mechanism of action. They all do the same thing. What Tim referred to is going in and actually cutting the DNA. So there, these technologies have existed for a long time, uh, the zinc finger nucleases, the mega nucleases, the talons. The most recent of them is the CRISPR-Cas9, and it's one that's gotten a, a lot of media attention. The big difference between CRISPR-Cas9 and these other techniques is that it's very, very straightforward as to what it is that you need to do. So they all have the same mechanism, but CRISPR-Cas9 is very, very easy to make new uh, nucleases. So you can direct it exactly where you want it to go very, very easily. Um, so at Intellia, uh, we are dealing with CRISPR-Cas9. There are three companies out there doing CRISPR-Cas9 therapeutically. There are essentially three different problems we're attempting to solve with CRISPR-Cas9. Um, and basically, when you cut the DNA, the DNA wants to repair itself. Um, a, a, most of the time, it repairs itself perfectly. That's what DNA needs to transmit the message to the next cell and to the next cell, so it has to repair perfectly. At a very low frequency, it doesn't repair itself perfectly. When that happens, you basically are destroying that gene. Um, and that's what we refer to as a knockout. So that is very good at taking out a gene that, you, that is having a negative function. The example that we're using here is TTR amyloidosis. If you take out the TTR gene in the liver of these patients, they're not going to make the TTR that, cause, that tends to build up and, and form amyloid plaques. Um, so this is, this is a very positive thing. In other cases, what you don't want to do is not actually just take out a bad copy of a gene, but actually take the bad copy of the gene and make it good again, make it what we refer to as wild type, um, a non-mutant copy of the gene. Um, in order to do that, you actually have to cut the DNA and then provide to that cell that you, where you've cut the DNA a copy of the gene that is actually good, that it actually can read from that and, and essentially do proofreading. Um, the example that we often use for this one is, is serpent A1, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Um, so to go in and correct that specific location. Um, and then f the, the final example is more analogous to gene therapy, as Tim was discussing, which is to actually insert a larger piece of DNA in there, a, a essentially a replacement version of the gene. Um, the, the various examples here, there are many inborn errors of metabolism that could be addressed by this particular um, method. Going from left to right, from the technical perspective, 
this is relatively easy and it gets progressively more difficult just at the level of being able to actually catalyze these events. As Tim mentioned, delivery is very, very key to all of this. And most of the work that I'm going to be discussing here, we're doing in the liver because we're capable of delivering these components into the liver. Um, so TTR is a liver-driven disease. Serpin A1, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is a liver-driven disease because, because delivery, it, it cannot be overstated how important delivery actually is. Um, we have a very similar approach to what uh, Tim was discussing, the ex vivo and the in vivo. The ex vivo taking cells out, editing them, and then putting them back into the patient. Again, following those, you can do all three of those different types of edits in, for example, hematopoietic stem cells in bone marrow. Um, and then the in vivo approaches, as I mentioned, mostly we're doing them within liver. Um, and then our initial focus is actually non-viral <coughs> delivery. It's a particle that happens to look like a virus, but it's actually non-viral. Um, and uh, most of our focus is on uh, liver disease. Um, and we are doing additional exploration in eye and muscle um, and some other tissues as well. Um, I do have some other slides, but I mean, that I think gives a good flavor on the, the gene editing. Um, no, great, thanks a lot. Thank you. Let me switch spots here. Yes, I'll try and not fall off. Okay. okay. So, the, so we're going to reserve the balance of the time for questions. Um, so any questions you might have, I, I think we, we have a mic, you can put your hand up in the back. I'm going to start out and ask a couple, and, and then we'll go from there. But really the, the purpose of this is to build on what um, Tim and Walter have just provided in terms of some background. And, and maybe if both of you could kind of describe, so, so you know, I, I think that was a very good foundation for why we believe this technology will work. And, and as you heard both of them say, delivery is going to be key to this. What, it, what advances in delivery around the vectors you talked about have been made in the last three or four years that give us confidence that we are beginning to solve this challenge? Delivery. You want to go first, Tim? Sure. So, you know, the challenge of gene therapy has been around we saw big changes in the 1980s, uh, moving out of things from adenoviruses to adeno-associated viruses. Now more Excuse me, would you be able to use the microphone so that they can hear you back here? Sure. Thank you. Oh yeah, well, cause that's right, he doesn't have a microphone. Sort of. Alright, can you hear me now? Can you hear me So there have been a lot of changes in gene therapy for the past, you know, 30 years. But really what you've seen in the past four or five years is, is, is an explosion in the, really the industrial space where companies have come on and taken a lot of technologies that have been incubating for the past 10 or 15 years in academic institutions to bring them into clinical trials. So now what you're seeing more is, is a lot of technologies moving out of the preclinical realm um, uh, that's now being more funded, okay, and getting into clinical trials. And so there are um, I believe 15 or more AAV type of gene therapy trials that are ongoing right now that is going, you're going to start to see a lot more clinical results presented in the next year, year and a half. Um, and in the case of Intellia, we're, we're doing a little bit of work with viruses. Most of our work, as I mentioned, is with these lipid nanoparticles. Some of you may be familiar with them. Alnylam has used them a, a lot in their siRNA uh, technologies. We are essentially building off a lot of what has been learned within that. Uh, in the case of CRISPR-Cas9, uh, we don't want the components, these are gene editing components, that we want them to go in and cut at the precise place that we want them to cut, but it is a permanent change and we're very conscious of these, they, they are specific, but they do have the capability of hitting other places in the genome which, where you don't want them to hit. They do it inefficiently, but when you're, when you're dealing with millions or tens of millions of events, it does happen. Um, so we're using a lipid nanoparticle that essentially allows the Cas9 to come on, do what it's supposed to do permanently at the space that it does it, and then the components don't exist anymore. If you put it in as a virus, as, as Tim mentioned, in the case where you're actually expressing the gene you want, that's a good thing. In the case where you're putting in a component that's going to edit the gene, you want it to be transient. You don't want it to last for a very long time. Right. So, there's a question over there. Right, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I have a mechanistical question, which is a little bit bi uh, bifurcated. I, as I understand it, uh, with the viral vector approach to, I'm, I'm over we're, here. We're, oh, right we're, there. we're blinded, we're blinded by, by, the light. Light. by the sun <laughs> <laughs> back there. So. Yeah. Okay. I don't think seeing me in the flesh is going to change anything I'm going to ask. But uh, the uh, 
the question I have is a little bifurcated. With, as I understand it, uh, the, uh, uh, the problems with viral vector delivered uh, gene therapy is that you're going to have to find a virus that targets the right cell, cell line, you know, infects it as it usually does, like the adenovirus or the lentiviral vectors, and then hopefully does what a virus does best, you know, place a copy of a desirable gene copy in the genome of the target cell, and if you if it doesn't do it to the cells you don't want it to do, then you get more of the effect you want and less of the effects you don't want. But we've seen in the research that that doesn't always work out. My, my question with CRISPR-Cas9 is exactly how does, uh, do you get access to the DNA uh, with that technology and do you still need a viral vector to make it all work or is that a, com a completely different approach that bypasses the shortcomings we've so far seen with the current viral vector models that we have? Uh, so the, sorry. Uh, the answer to, th to that is what we're trying to do, and I'll, I'll speak specifically around the, the knockout approach because it's the simplest one uh, to explain. Basically what we need to supply into the cell, and in this case the hepatocyte, so I'll discuss hepatocytes, so this is the liver cells. Um, what we need to deliver is a piece of RNA that tells the Cas9 where it is supposed to go within the, the, the genome. Um, and we need to deliver the Cas9 protein, which is the nuclease itself. It is the thing that cuts the DNA. Um, so we're able to put both of those components inside a lipid nanoparticle. When the lipid nanoparticle is binds to the hepatocyte, and it essentially binds to all hepatocytes, the cargo, what it is carrying, is released, and that is released and automatically trafficked into the nucleus of the cell, which is where the DNA is. So it, it essentially guides itself into the compartment of the cell it needs to be in, which is the nucleus, and directly to the site in the DNA that it needs to go to. Um, it cuts, it, in, in, the, in its simplest sense, there are only two copies of the thing that it needs to cut. Every, you know, with the exception of X-linked conditions, there are, there are two alleles of the gene. It goes in, it only needs to cut in two places. As long as it can survive for that period of time, it does what we need it to do. Uh, just a slightly higher level answer to your question um, also is that, you know, the first generation technologies for a lot of the gene editing approaches are now, if you recall on one of the earlier slides, you've got two approaches. You can either put something directly into the body or you can take cells out of the body and correct them there first. So that's an easier way to deliver the technology that you're talking about and that's how a lot of the earlier stages are going. Take cells out, correct them with CRISPR-Cas9 or TALIN or, or meganuclease and then put them back in. Second generation approaches are gonna be more when you take an AAV or lentivirus or something and be able to go in and directly correct with um, that way. So, hope that answers. I think there's a question. Um, this is just a segue into that same question. So, might we expect then that non-viral delivery systems will be safer than the viral delivery systems were in the past? We're, we're very careful about the word safe. <laughs> so um, so non-viral delivery certainly has some advantages from the perspective of um, not necessarily eliciting a larger immune response, but that's a multi-tiered question where you start to get into not only is it the virus or the non-viral part of the virus, but you're also talking about the actual thing that you're putting in eliciting an immune response. So it's something that we monitor in clinical trials. Um, but specifically, I think to answer your question about non-viral versus viral, again, gene therapy is all about delivery, and sometimes you're constricted about how, what approach you can actually use to get into the target tissue or the target cells that you want. Different companies have different approaches. You might want to explain why AAV is thought to be safe, safer. I mean, it's one of the reasons why. Yeah, yeah so, so different AAVs have different um, amounts that they'll elicit an immune response and also depends on the route that you give by the administration. So there's a company called Avexis, for example, that is doing gene therapy for spinal muscular atrophy. They've given AAV9 by intravenous delivery. Um, they've treated 50, over 15 patients, and these kids, I mean, again, 90% of these kids don't reach the age three. You know, and now what you're seeing out on the, on the internet and the, the data that's being presented is amazing clinical success of these kids being able to sit up and hold a bottle, um, whereas before they, you know, frankly, probably would not have been alive. You know, so, you know, what's come out of that has been a large amount of safety, you know, but now you're also starting to see some early efficacy. 
but you have to balance that against there are other AAVs, so AAV5, if you give that by an, an intravenous administration, it tends to be a little bit more, um, to elicit a little bit more of an immune response. So again, it's a, it's a balance between which AAV, there's a general uh, appreciation, that there's a broader safety profile, but you, know, you still have to go through things like immunosuppression when you're in clinical trials. So, and again, that gets weaned off as, as the trials uh, wear on. And I, yeah, I would just say okay. it's the right tool for the right job is essentially what it comes down to. That, yeah. you know, safety is a paramount concern here, but it's a question, as Tim said, of, of choosing the correct technology for what it is that you want to do. Yeah. Hi. Um, perfect to piggyback on what you said. So I'm here with spinal muscular atrophy. Um, so I just uh, spoke at a Vexus a few weeks ago. Um, so my question is, um, so in our disease, we have the AAV9 with a Vexus and in clinical trial, 15 patients, as you said. Um, so of course, incredibly interested in CRISPR technology. Um, so I've been following and reading for months now. <laughs> um, and so I guess my question is, and I think everyone would be interested, um, how do we encourage you guys or how do you choose the diseases in which you would like to work with first? And does it have to do with ease of administration? Does it have to do with um, somebody in the community reaching out? How do you make those choices? Sure. So. I'm a scientist, so my answer is going to be very science-driven. Um, uh, basically, it goes back to the limitation of the technology and what the technology can do right now um, and what we hope it will be able to do later. At this point in time, the technologies are very, very good at delivering to the liver. That's both the viral work and the non-viral work. The, our primary focus is um, for the in vivo, the direct to delivery that we're talking about, is for it to be within the liver. So uh, one of the primary criteria for us choosing the diseases that we're able to pursue is the ones that we actually feel we can have an impact on, those that are, are, are liver driven. Um, we do have some other diseases. We do uh, do the ex vivo approach. Most of that works actually in collaboration with Novartis. But in that particular case, it needs to be, again, needs to be cells that you can take out and edit and put back into the patient. There are relatively limited number of cells that you can actually do that with. Um, so it's it really the technology and is driving our disease selection, essentially, is what it comes down to. So Abiona has licensed and licensed a number of programs, and we've looked at, you know, dozens, you know, around the world. Um, and it comes down to a variety of things. Uh, first is, has the, the particular gene therapy shown efficacy in preclinical models? Okay, so being able to say, okay, this is a rare disease, you know, we look at, you know, has the technology been able to, usually in a mouse model, uh, shown a significant amount of efficacy? You know, and then we start to t take it farther out and say, okay, well, what's the patient population size? You know, how is the manufacturing going to be a consideration on, um, you know, what we're already doing? So there's a lot of multiples that we look at when trying to select rare disease gene therapies uh, in particular. Um, but often for any one of the companies that have been, that we would talk about, it's usually what's been in their wheelhouse. So some companies are, cent are metabolic disease, some are muscular, some are, are ophthalmologic, you know, and usually you'll find them try to find things that they already have expertise in, you know, but it's going to, as I think Walter said, it comes back to in many aspects, it comes back to the data. Has it, has it shown something that it looks like it's going to work? Has the data been reproducible, reviewed? Um, but that's generally what goes into selecting a, a gene therapy. In the rare circumstance for a company both of our sizes, you know, we'll do de novo development that says, okay, well, you know, we think we're working on a, on a particular central nervous system disease. You know, we know all of the things that go into that. We know the regulatory hurdles. We know the manufacturing hurdles. We've already had conversations with the FDA. So ABON is working on a lot of AV9 delivered by IV therapies. So the question is as well, are there other things that will be, would make sense for us to start our own program because we've already got that interaction with the FDA and, you know, again, manufacturing is a, the big uh, elephant in the room a lot of the times that, you know, you have to address. But sorry, long answer, but hope that helps. In that particular case, what you'd need to do is intrathecal delivery. Um, and 
I, I, I just want to be completely level set. We are exploring such things, but we are literally at the stage of doing it in small animals. And so I don't want you know people to think that you know we're making great strides in it. Just we are exploring it, but it is very very early days for doing that. Oh, hi. I am attending um, as the parent to a little boy that's got a chromosome deletion, and he's missing a gene. And um, I've heard that this CRISPR-Cas9 could potentially fuse his genes back together. Is that something potentially that parents can count on one day, or is that kind of being idealistic? I'll again answer from the scientific perspective. Um, so theoretically, yes. I mean, that, that the technology is such that you can cut DNA and you can insert new pieces of DNA in, in, the, in your particular case, you could insert that copy of that particular gene. There is a very, very long road from being able to do it in a tissue culture cell, a cell in a lab, and actually go from there to, to a patient. Um, so CRISPR-Cas9 is extremely powerful, it's extremely robust, and it's extremely young as a technology. Um, so I, I'll, the answer is, unfortunately, theoretically, yes. Um, and I, I, we can't really go beyond that at this point. Hi, my question is pertaining to the slide that you uh, showed about the different serotypes of the AAV vector, and you were showing that in the AAV9 was, uh, I guess, predominantly uh, better for the heart, but in the, um, yeah, one more, a couple of slides back. Um, the AAV1, 6 and 7, are you saying that they are better delivery for um, skeletal muscle? Yeah, so there's a lot of work that's been done to show um, individual serotype specificity for certain tissues. So um, a company called Milo Biotechnology, for example. What is it? Milo. Milo, uh, okay. Also at a nationwide children's hospital. You know, they're doing um, uh, AAV gene therapy for um, uh, Becker's muscular dystrophy, mm -hmm. for Duchenne. Um, I believe they're using AV1, you know, specifically. So, you know, again, it's, it's, as Walter said, it's choosing the right, right AAV for the right disease. And again, you go even to more nuanced about that. It's right delivery method, whether you're going to go intramuscular injections or intrathecal. Or systemic, right. Yep. Could you also talk just a little bit, maybe to answer about next generation AV? I mean, just so they don't think that this is the only shopping list we're looking at. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the challenges with AAV tech, by, um, gene therapy in particular is that once you get an AAV, you can't get that again because the body is going to give you uh, an immune response. Mm -hmm. So if you get an injection of AAV5, okay, you're going to have antibodies and it's going to make it a lot more challenging. Now there are some studies that have been able to show doing immunosuppression and a few other things that in the future maybe you could get an a another AAV5 injection. but. What the next generation is what you're trying to see more companies get, get around is, okay, well, AV 2 through 10, you want to say, now there's a whole new field that's really trying to look at the next question. How do you, how do you get the next, you know, AAV, you know, we'll call it, you know, Pi 74 or, you know, something where that says, okay, this is also going to be good at getting into central nervous system tissue or muscular tissue. So some companies are starting, and we, we just announced that we have a new vector library, for example, to go after second generation targets. It also helps get around, also helps answer the question of, there are some patients that come in and already have existing antibodies, you know, to these therapies. Interesting. So it helps, it helps answer the question, how can we treat patients that already have, um, you know, existing antibodies to AAV9, for example, or how do you go to about a, a question for redosing at some point, five years, 10 years, you know, in the future that how would you, you know, give the same therapy again? So um, we are my tubular myopathy. I had um, the canine model, the, uh, the dog, and we are in uh, preclinical for the um, AAV9. And so I'm looking at that slide and my I'm favorite. thinking, mm. so in my dog model, it's beautiful. It's robust. It's outstanding. But now uh, the big question is, and of course, I'm not on that side. I'm on the patient advocacy side. So my question is now looking at the slide, is that really truly the best vector for us if we are now seeing some studies that uh, the AAV 1, 6, and 7 are better for the skeletal muscle system? Well, again, it's, it's probably a, a little more nuanced because AAV 1 is also very immunogenic. Yeah. Is immunogenic? Okay, so it'll elicit a higher immune response. Um, and just because one, you know, again, there's, this isn't black and white, there's a lot of overlap. 
You know, so AAV9, for example, you give it by IV, it gets to all the organs in the body. You know, so, you know, there are studies that are, you know, well, they'll do AAV1 first, and then they'll move to AAV9, okay, potentially for direct muscular ejections. So, you know, the field is still evolving to the point that says, well, can you use more than one AAV to target a particular disease? And the answer is yes, but you still have to be selective. And it also gets, again, it's, it's more nuanced when the specific thing that's driving the expression, the thing called the promoter, um, yeah, the promoter is also going to be selective or specific. You can give something that's only going to express in muscle tissue or only going to express in you know, the eye, for example. Um, but again, that's when you, know, you start to go down in the, in the tiers of granularity about this is why every gene therapy that's out there you know, is just a little bit different. And a great example of this is hemophilia. There are seven companies working on AAV gene therapies, four main different gene therapies. Every single one of them is a little bit nuanced, you know, and it's a challenge because you never know. It's not going to be who wins, okay, or who is better. In some cases, it's going to be whose is longer, you know, who lasts longer. And we won't know those results for years. Uh, that's great. Some fun, some really fun uh, data is looking at, at uh, dentes, um, you know, and some of the models that they're doing, and uh, that's really fantastic uh, preclinical results. So, so you kind of mentioned very briefly some of the regulatory aspects going on here, but I'm curious if you could provide some more detail there about what your conversations with, F with FDA have been like in terms of, you know, do you feel like they truly understand this, this technology because it is so new and it seems like a lot of the cutting edge stuff is going on either in academia or in, in industry and I'm curious, you know, do they have the right expertise to, to properly review these trials and, and I mention this because, you know, this is amazing technology but if it doesn't actually get to patients at the end of the day then you know, we're not really making progress, so I was hoping you could shed some light on that. So I'll speak just briefly to it around CRISPR-Cas9. Um, so we've been uh, engaged with the government and the regulatory agencies on this, uh, in large part to educate them on the technology itself. This is, again, it's very early stage for CRISPR-Cas9. Some of this gr ground has been trod uh, before us with the other gene editing technologies, Sangamo and so on, these other companies are in there. So the, the, the agencies are familiar with gene editing as a technology. Um, the ease of CRISPR-Cas9 means that they're going to be looking at a lot more of those sorts of technologies. So we're working to help educate them and, and uh, as much as possible make sure that the, the, the path for or what we want to move along is as smooth as possible. Yeah, I'd say that the key component that Walter mentioned is education, um, but it's also, it's, and, and frankly, it's being cautious of hubris. You know, the FDA sees so many more therapies than any one company is going to be able to have exposure to. And so, you know, when the FDA often comes back and says, you know, well, we really think you should, you might want to take a look at this particular thing, you know, usually you want to do that because they have seen something they can't comment about, but you usually want to listen to them. You know, but again, it's a lot about educating the, the FDA on, on rare diseases. I mean, there are, you hear thrown out a lot, you know, there are 7,000 rare diseases. Well, there are only so many minds at the FDA that they can, you know, listen and talk to on a daily basis or weekly basis about a particular gene therapy or a particular disease. So a lot of what we end up doing is going and helping and educating the FDA reviewers on what the, um, you know, the disease manifestations are, the disease progression, which is why the, you know, natural history studies are so critical right now, um, and how that, you know, you, can, you work with the FDA to develop what's needed. Let me just add one thing. We were actually just um, at the FDA two days ago with a number of folks from the gene therapy community, company representatives, really talking about an issue that's critical to this, which is standards. And so if we're gonna be developing these products, they need and we need to have consensus standards that we can use to measure, uh, the, the, to measure the work that they're doing. So reference standards, for example, for AAVs or lentiviral vectors. And I mean, there, you know, there is a deep knowledge of this there at the agency. We've seen that. They're working very closely with us. It's a very good working relationship and, and we hope to continue that. You mentioned briefly the uh, zinc finger or ZFP technology. I know Sangamo is working on that. Uh, I was uh, maybe a little deeper dive into what that term means and how it's, uh, the approach is and maybe uh, compare and contrast the zinc finger approach to uh, standard AAV. Yeah, sure. So um, the, they both have the same primary function, which is to cut DNA. Um, 
uh, basically, to make a zinc finger nuclease, you, you basically need to make um, a specific new protein to target the sequence of DNA that you are interested in going after. And that's technically very difficult or technically relatively difficult to do. Um, in the case of CRISPR-Cas9, the nuclease is guided to the DNA by a piece of RNA. Um, so essentially, DNA is usually represented as a double helix because there are two strands that pair with one another. There are nucleoside, nucleotides on one side and nucleotides on the other, and they have a natural affinity for one another. CRISPR-Cas9 uses its RNA and DNA. They have exactly the same phenomenon that you can essentially pair those bases. That makes it very, very easy to change the targeting of the nuclease. So if you discover that, for example, you've made a zinc finger nuclease and it cuts at the spot that you want it to cut, um, and it also cuts at a different spot, you then have to go back at the protein engineering level and redesign the zinc finger nuclease from the ground up. In the case of CRISPR-Cas9, and this is really the big, the big advantage of it, the thing that's, that separates it out, is that all you have to do is go and design a new piece of RNA, uh, uh, which is simply, it can literally be made in a laboratory on a synthesizer in a day. You can retarget the nuclease in a single day. You don't have to remake the entire thing that you're trying to, to, to use. One part of it is generic, that's the Cas9, and one part of it is specific, which is the, which is the CRISPR molecule, and it's relatively easy to make. Okay, we've got a question right here, and I think we're going to have to wrap it up. It's about 4.30. There we go. Did you want her to know she was far out? Okay, go ahead. Okay, also, um, my question relates to the many different approaches that are there and that have to be targeted to the different diseases. So if you step back and you think of the many, many rare diseases, and especially the ultra-rare diseases, then it becomes... Um, you know, challenging to see how we could do this quickly enough to meet the need of everybody because patients can't wait, right? So is there a way then to share certain parts of the path, like walk part of the road together in sort of a pre-competitive space so that you could help more people more quickly because the you know, unique thing would be in what you insert, or, you know, but not in the platform? Sure, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, there are many of you that, that may say, hey, you know, um, my child is recently diagnosed with this rare disease and there are 163, you know, patients that have been confirmed in the world. How do I help, how do I, how do I design, how can, is there gonna be a therapy for me, for my child? You know, and the best, I, I think the best approach that you have at that point is to find the company Okay, or the researchers that are working on similar diseases. So if it's a muscle disease, you go to a company that's working on muscle diseases. If it's a metabolic disease, you go to a metabolic disease and say, what can, how can you help me develop this type of, of therapy? Because uh, to what I was saying earlier, you know, we have a wheelhouse. You know, there are things that we're good at. You know, we're good at all of the, we know that if we give this particular virus by an IV injection, this is what's going to happen. It's going to go to these organs, and we know how much it's going to get there. Um, we know the immune, the immune response is going to happen. You know, so you, you basically get a leg up on starting because you already know something about it. And when you're talking about trying to, you know, 7,000 rare diseases, 95% of them don't have a therapy that's in development or, um, you know, approved. How do you get to that? How do you get that 95%, you know, down to 10%? Well, it's trying to leverage what's already known, but you're going to have to do that in a very focused manner. I hope that answered your question. And there, sorry, there's just one other aspect to that, and that is also regulatory. It does go back to the regulatory question. And gene therapy or gene editing, it is treated like any other drug. It needs to go through the, the full pathway um, of drugs, and first it needs to be demonstrated to be safe. Um, you know, that's one of F the FDA's primary concerns. Um, so that does limit the, essentially the speed and the number of things that one can take through. You do have to go through full regulatory approval, of course. Everyone recognizes that. Um, so part of the education discussions with the FDA is to see if there are certain things that where the, the path can be uh, made shorter or simpler or whatever to simply to, to try and get more treatments in for more different diseases. Um, but that, again, that's something that's a, a, a conversation between academics and advocacy groups and industry and, and the regulatory agencies. Well, thank you. Um, I think we have to end here. Please join me in uh, thanking our speakers. Great presentation.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.